All right, guys, we're going to pick up here talking about uh, innervation and blood supply to skin. So we know that skin is highly innervated because that means it has lots of nerve fibers. And it also has a lot of blood supply because we talk about the blood as being a res I'm sorry, the skin as being a reservoir of blood. You know, your skin contains up to 20% of your blood's volume or more, so it can store a lot of blood. Now, what happens is that we find a lot of nerve fibers in the dermis that can sense things like touch, pressure, temperature, pain, vibration. But they can also control the diameter of your blood vessels. And we'll talk, we'll come back to that too, you guys. Now we have tactile or touch receptors. And we've talked about some already, like there's the Meisner's corpuscles in the in the papillary layer of dermis. There's the Pacidian corpuscles that you find deep in the dermis. You got free nerve endings that kind of project up towards the epidermis. You got tactile cells or Merkel cells in the epidermis. So there's lots of different ways to feel with your skin. Now those nerve fibers can also help regulate blood flow because in many of your blood vessels, there's smooth muscle that's regulatable, okay? So what happens is we can change the contracted state of smooth muscle in our vessels to either vasodilate or vasoconstrict. If we vasodilate by, by actually not stimulating muscle to contract, the muscle will relax, allows the vessel to get wider, and then you can increase blood flow, right? So you have vasodilation, a wider blood vessel, blood flow increases, vasoconstriction, leads to uh, basically, well, we have a strong muscle contraction that causes the vessel to constrict. That reduces blood flow to skin. Now, um, there's also some nerve endings that can control glandular secretions, like there's nerve endings that stimulate sweat glands to start. Okay? Um, oil glands, on the other hand, oil glands are regulated by hormones. So oil activity, bless you, is a, is a hormone effect. So uh, we know that, that our skin has lots of blood vessels. So our dermis contains these blood vessels that can actually change their, their state, like their size. So uh, if a blood vessel <laughs> vasodilates, then you have an increase in blood flow. And if it vasoconstricts, then you have a decrease in blood flow, right? So under what circumstances might you want to have an increase in blood flow in skin? If you're hot. Yeah, if you're hot, right? That way you can actually dissipate that heat and cool down, right? So what about vasoconstriction? When might you want to vasoconstrict blood away from skin? If you're cold, right? Because if you're cold, you want to conserve your body heat and not have heat dissipate from your skin. So you can vasoconstrict, re reduce blood flow to skin. That way the blood actually goes to deeper organs and you stay warmer, right? So if you're cold, you can vasoconstrict. If you're hot, you can vasodilate. And there's other things that can cause vasoconstriction and vasodilation, but we'll talk about that in AMP2. Now, we talked about how there's a subcutaneous layer of hypodermis, and that's not actually part of skin. But it does have areolar uh, connective tissue and adipose as well. And some of the functions of the hypodermis are to protect underlying structures. You know, skin's not that thick. I mean, it's thick enough to serve as a pretty decent protective barrier. But skin itself is not a good cushion. So it's the hypodermis below skin that serves as a nice protective cushion because it's full of adipose, right? Think about like where there are bony prominences, like a bony part um, in your body where there might be some skin there too. If there's just skin right on bone, then there's not a whole lot of cushion between the bone and skin and that can start to wear on each other and that can lead to wounds and sores, right? Well, by having a nice thick hypodermis there, there's an additional layer of cushion so that these, these bony, bony prominences don't just like protrude up through your skin, right? Or vice versa, like otherwise, you know, it's, it's hard to get damage deeper in your body, right? If you have a nice... Uh, hypodermis there. The hypodermis, because it's made of fat, also helps store energy, right? So fat is one of those molecules. You can get the most ATP per fat molecule versus any other nutrient. So it's a good way to store energy for later use. Um, it also functions as a thermal insulation mechanism. You know, you look like seals and stuff, and seals look like big old rounded creatures. Well, the, the hypodermis on a seal is super thick, you know, you think about it, like these things, these seals can swim around in water that's near freezing, right? They can swim around like in 30, 30, 33 degree water. Well, why don't they freeze to death? You know, a human would last minutes in 33 degree water. But a seal, well, they can thermoregulate better in part because they have like a nice thick hypodermis to function as like a thermal insulation, if that makes sense. So that's the function of the subcutaneous tissue. This is a really nice slide to summarize what we talked about, you guys. So you get the epidermis, and it's, it, the layers of the epidermis, and the, uh, the features of each of those layers. We got the papillary layer of dermis, um, and the reticular layer of dermis, and some of the, the features of those layers. And then the subcutaneous tissue, as well as what you find in that subcutaneous tissue. 
Now, when we're talking about like the larger blood vessels, like arteries and veins, uh, you find those larger blood vessels uh, in the hypodermis. Okay, so um, you know if someone has a, has a large wound, it's bleeding quite a bit. It's actually no longer in the dermis. You're actually in the hypodermis. That's where the larger blood vessels are located. Okay, you find smaller blood vessels in skin. So if it's just a if it's just a skin wound, it, you can't bleed that much just from a skin wound, right? <laughs> If it's bleeding a lot, you're all the way through skin, you're in the hypodermis, that's where the larger blood vessels are, okay? Like when you think about going for a large vein for a vein puncture, that's not in the skin, that's in the hypodermis, like the subcutaneous portion. Um, there are some superficial veins which you can see, you know, you can, sometimes you can see superficial veins here. You guys, some of these are in your dermis, like the ones in your wrist or elsewhere, um, but larger veins that you can't necessarily see through your skin, but you might see kind of protruding up on skin, those are actually in the hypodermis. And not just veins, but arteries as well. Um, now, what we're going to do next is move on to structure of, of nails and hair, as well as exocrine glands. Nails and hair are both made of keratin. And like keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, these basically grow in a very similar way. So we'll talk about the structure of a nail and hair, and then talk about some of the exocrine glands of skin. So remember, an exocrine gland is one that has a duct. You got it. If it's exocrine, it has a duct. What about endocrine glands? They don't have Ductless, a right? They don't have a duct. Good. So the exocrine glands of skin are the glands that have a duct. And this could be oil or sweat. So uh, we'll first talk about the nail structure, you guys. And we, we call this like a scale-like modification of stratum corneum. Think of like your fingernails and toenails as a really, really thick layer of stratum corneum that actually grows out and gets it has its own projection, right? Same with hair as well. It's sort of this little thickened area of stratum corneum, but what's stratum, what's stratum corneum mostly made of? Keratin. Keratin, you got it. So fingernails and hair and toenails, that's mostly made of keratin. And keratin's a really tough protein. So uh, we have a nail plate, which is the whitish sort of free edge of that nail. We have the nail body, which is the pinkish part of the nail, and the nail root, which is covered by skin. Now, uh, what happens, you guys, is that the nail body is actually covered by a layer of epidermis called the nail bed. And the nail bed is just what underlies the body there. So, like, you know, if you, if you look at the, the tissue just below your nail, you, you can push on it, it gets kind of white. That's the nail bed, okay? And, you know, if, if you lose your fingernail, that exposed tissue that where your fingernail used to be, that's the nail bed. It's nail still, bed's under the nail plate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, this nail bed, you guys, it's still stratified squamous epithelium, but it's not as thick. And it's very sensitive. That's why when you lose a nail, it can hurt quite a bit. There's a lot of sensor endings there. Um, we have a nail matrix, which is actually a thickened growing part of the nail bed. And you find this deep, deep near the sort of the, the back part of the nail here, like the more proximal edge of that nail. That's where the nail matrix is. And the nail matrix is the site of rapid cell division. And this is where the cells are dividing turning into like keratinocytes, and they're turning into something like a stratum corneum that then grows out, which you know is a, is a nail. So what's weird is that your nail is basically just like a thick piece of stratum corneum that grows in a particular shape, which is kind of weird. Um, the lunula is just sort of that whitish semilunar part. Lunula just means like moon-shaped. So it's the whitish semilunar part of the nail there. Um, so if you look at this here, you guys, we've got the nail body here. Here's the lunula here. you got a free edge when it grows out. And then deep back here by the lunula, as a part of the nail bed, you can have the nail matrix back here. In fact, if we go look at this slide in cross-section, so here's the nail bed. All of this part's the nail body, which is actually the fingernail part. The nail bed is what underlies it, so it's still stratified squamous epithelium. But if we keep going back, 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 oh, here, okay, here we go. All of this back here is the nail matrix. Now, the nail matrix is where cells rapidly divide, and as these cells divide, they basically push into the growing nail, which is why your nails actually grow out like this. You don't have new nail growth from this area. Like there's no new, new nail growth in the body part of the nail, if that makes sense. New nail growth only comes from the matrix. So if you ever lost uh, like the whole nail before, you know, it doesn't just slowly, slowly appear from the surface. It kind of grows out from the unexposed skin, right? And then slowly comes back out. Uh, it's common in runners, like when the runners are People who run long distance typically lose their, their toenails. It just kind of wears them out. <laughs> yeah, like the ultra marathon runners, a lot of those guys lose their toenails. Yeah, the answer is that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, 
So the side of new nail growth then is that nail matrix. What do you guys think would happen if someone damaged their nail matrix? Their nail will grow. Got it. Nail stop growing. So in sometimes if you damage the nail, if it's damaged in the right spot, I want to say right because that air quotes is right. You might not get the nail that grows back. It just may never grow back. Um, or if it grows back, maybe it grows back really, really slowly. Okay, so it's kind of interesting. Now um, it turns out that sorry, the nail yeah. roots on top of the um, on top of the nail. The nail roots on top of the nail plate. Yeah, exactly. So the plate is all of this tissue right here, the stratified squamous epithelium. The body is this sort of exposed edge, and then the root is actually what's sort of deep in the in this fold of epidermis. And then this back fold of epidermis is the matrix. Okay. Good question. So for hair, you guys, um, they're columns of keratinocytes, but these keratinocytes lack any organelles or a nucleus. So basically, like a nail, hair is just a big old shaft of keratin. Now, our hair has um, you know, different parts, like a bulb, a root, and a shaft. And there's different types of hair, like lanugo, vellus, and terminal hair. Uh, terminal hair is like the thick, coarse kind of hair. Vellus hair is like the peach fuzz, okay? Um, and I'm not sure what lanugo is. I, gotta, I, gotta, I need to look that up. It says it until the, like, the second trimester. Oh, okay. It starts forming, and then the, it goes away once the baby That makes forms. sense. Yeah, because I'm not like a, I don't know a lot about development. That makes sense. So this is sort of a, a type of hair you'd find on, like, prenatally, yeah. but it disappears after birth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, the regions of hair, you guys, like the bulb, the root, and shaft. The bulb is, guess what? Just the bulbous part. The root is everything that's in the dermis, and the shaft is actually basically the exposed part of that hair. Okay. So uh, the bulb is that swelling of epithelial cells where the hair originates. The root is uh, basically the portion of that's, that's deep to the skin surface, and the shaft is what extends beyond the, the skin surface. So the exposed part of hair is the shaft. Okay. Um, the hair follicles, what surrounds each hair, and every hair follicle is associated with an erector pili. What was the function of erector pili again? Goosebumps. You got it. Or, I don't know, parts of the country call them goose pimples. And there's other words, too, that I'm not familiar with. I know. I, yeah. Apparently, that's a thing, too. <laughs> I know. Actually, there's a really interesting quiz, you guys. You can take it online. It's a linguistics quiz. And I've taken this a couple times, just kind of figure. It'll ask you, like, in a series of 25 questions, like, what you call certain things. It'll give you a series of words you can choose. And in 25 questions, it can tell you within reasonable accuracy where your dialect is from in the United States. Yeah, and for me, you guys, it nailed exactly where it's from. And everybody I've, I've had, it, had to do it to, it nails where they're from. Or it gets where their parents are from. You know, like if they're, one parent's from Ohio, another one's from New York, then they, it, like those areas light up because then they learn how to speak like their parents. Well, I'll send you guys a link. Um, what I learned from this quiz, though, you guys, is there are some weird expressions. Like, what do you guys call it when it's raining and it's sunny out? Uh, I heard... You call it sun shower? Yeah. I... <laughs> okay. The Californians in this room have no word for it. Because it never rains. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no word for it. <laughs> and if it rains, it's not sunny, right? Yeah, if it rains, it's, it's just like rain. a sprinkle for days. Yeah. Um, well, what do you call it? I don't Oh, okay. Interesting. What were you saying? <laughs> yeah, okay. The one, the one I saw. Maybe we were talking about the same one. The one I saw. I guess this is a southern thing too, you guys. I guess sometimes if it's if it's raining and it's sunny out, it's a southern expression. You say the devil's beating his wife with a frying pan. Yes. <laughs> the devil's beating his wife with a frying pan. I didn't hear the frying pan. I just yeah. hear the devil's beating. His right. Wife. That's a Why? saying. I know. It really is. So when it's raining and it's sunny. So, in the South, I'm like, I don't understand that expression at all, right? I get the sun shower. It doesn't. <laughs> Actually, there might be a good story behind it. I don't know what it is at all. Yeah. I didn't hear the frying pan, though. Yeah. There's probably different variations of it. Um, yeah, exactly. So this bulbous part, you guys, the bulb, <laughs> then you got the root and the shaft. Good. Um, what do you guys think the, the area of the hair where, where new hair growth occurs is called? Like the nail. Matrix. You got it. The matrix. 
And guess what? There's a little papilla there, which has capillary loops, and it supplies those dividing cells with enough nutrients. That way, this hair can grow uh, fairly quickly. Um, the average human loses about 200 scalp hairs a day. So about 200 scalp hair, hairs a day we lose. Yeah, that's average, right? What does the cortex do? The cortex is just the outer layer of hair. Oh, okay. So it's just a layer in the hair itself. So what happens when they go and fall? Does the matrix stop working? Keep bringing come back to that. Okay. So uh, some different functions of hair involve, and for one, it's involved in protection. You know, if we're standing upright and the sun's right above us, and the sun's beating down on top of our heads, well, our hair is actually also like sunscreen. You know, it's pretty hard to get a scalp burn unless no, your hair is really short or you don't have hair there, right? Or, or, or if you're parted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. if you have parted hair, yeah, exactly. Um, now, hair is also involved with heat retention. So you find a lot of hair in the areas of your body where there's like exposed, like superficial blood vessels, or you might lose a lot of heat there. So it's involved with some heat retention. Hair also has sensory receptors because every hair follicle has a uh, a hair root plexus or nerve root plexus that surrounds that follicle so that when, the, when the hairs bend, you can activate these nerve endings and feel that hair bending. You know, other animals have really highly developed root hair plexuses like the whiskers on some animals, you know, like mice and rats, cats and dogs have those long whiskers. Those are actually different than like, you know, human face hairs. In fact, the, those whiskers are hooked up with these very specialized endings um, and these things, they can, they're super sensitive. Like, they can actually can feel things that we can't even fathom just is with their whiskers. It, is yeah. it true that if you cut a cat's whiskers, like, you totally, like, throw them off balance? Well, the, it, they would normally use that to also help them understand things around them. And it's like, I'll give you an example. If all of a sudden you lost a sense, like, let's say if you couldn't see anymore, you know, it would be difficult. It would take a little while to kind of figure out how to go about your life not seeing. You would relearn, though. And so I'd imagine, I don't know this, I've never heard that before, but I would guess, though, if you did cut off the whiskers of a cat, they wouldn't have that sense anymore, so they couldn't use it, and they couldn't rely on it, so they would need to figure out something else. Yeah, good question. Uh, hair for visual identification. Okay, that's weird. That's a weird function. Um, and chemical signal dispersal. That's interesting. What's a chemical signal that hair might disperse? Pheromones. Pheromones, you got it. So here's a weird thing about pheromones, you guys is scientists have not even identified the receptor for pheromones. We found it in other animals, like we know where it's at in rats and, and mice and that kind of stuff, cats and dogs, but we don't know where it is in humans. But there is evidence for pheromonal communication in humans. Do you guys know what this is? Like how, what's the evidence for pheromones in humans? Attraction. Attraction. Like, you know, sometimes it, you can be like, you get attracted to somebody based on their odor. In fact, what's interesting is in these blind trials, like you can blindfold somebody and they just smell a used shirt, you know, based on the smell of the shirt, that can help predict whether or not they're going to be attracted with that, that person. So that's kind of cool. Um, also, uh, when female menstrual cycles sync up, right? How's that work? Does everyone get together and be like, all right, you guys, here's what's up. <laughs> on next Tuesday, that's when it's going to begin, all right? No. That's not <laughs> you don't plan for it. It just sort of starts happening. That's also believed to be pheromonal communication, where it's how, you, how one person's physiology can affect the physiology of others. So that's kind of interesting. So it's um, not actually Well, it would. It would because you you would need to be exposed to someone long enough to get enough pheromones to affect your physiology and sync up. Yeah, so it does relate to people living, yeah, working together, living together, being in class together, I guess. I don't know. I think it requires quite a bit of exposure. Yeah. Like, you have to be living. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. Um, and I've heard some interesting things about pheromones, but that's one of the functions of hair is to help distribute those pheromones. So uh, someone had a question about baldness. Yes. We'll talk about alopecia here, you guys. So alopecia <laughs> is just age-related um, uh, hair thinning. It occurs in both sexes after age 40 or so. And that's just a normal consequence of aging. Now alopecia uh, is different than true baldness. So true baldness is genetically determined. It is sex um, chromosome influence, so it runs in families. And in males, it relates to something called DHT, or dihydrotestosterone. So DHT is what we call super testosterone. It's like the most potent form of testosterone. And that's, when, that's the one that's associated with male pattern baldness. We call this true baldness or frank baldness. 
So I think that's kind of interesting how it's actually testosterone that can cause males to go bald. And so I think that like bald males should maybe take that as a sign of like maybe manliness. You know, instead of, instead of being like ashamed of their baldness, like they should flaunt it. Like I'm, I got so much testosterone, my hair is running away from my scalp, right? <laughs> I think that's kind of cool. <laughs> so dihydrotestosterone, DHT. Um, so the first yeah. one, what is, how do you say it? L alopecia. Alopecia, that's not caused by genetics and hormones? Like, that's just natural? Um, yeah, it's more of a natural consequence of aging. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yes? I'm just going back to what you had just said. I had read that men who um, are bald in the back, or men who are bald in the front are painters, and men who are bald in the back are lovers, and men who are bald in the front have that painter. <laughs> 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 that's funny <laughs> uh, so then what's what's Donald Trump then oh good question so we know that hair color is due to melanin so it's an underactivity of melanocytes that's only part of the story though because if you look at the structure of a gray hair versus a hair that has color to it, um, what you find is that inside that gray hair, there's a lot of air bubbles. And so instead of it being a solid kind of thick shaft of hair, it's, there's no melanin. And instead of there being melanin, you got lots of little air bubbles. And it's believed that those air, bubble, air bubbles come from a hydrogen peroxide reaction inside the hair root that uh, not only bleaches any kind of melanin that might be there, but also leads to the production of those little air bubbles. And that seems to relate with sort of differences in metabolism between people. So um, graying of hair is it's interesting. Is that genetics? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing about this, though, is like you can't, you can't necessarily always say that one thing is only genetic and one thing is environmental. I'd say for most conditions, there's kind of like a blend. Yeah. So for, there's two types of excretion glands in the body, you guys. We've got sweat glands and sebaceous glands. The sweat glands are the pseudoriferous glands, a.k.a. Sweat glands. Why did I say that? Um, they produce a more watery type of solution. The sweat. Now, what's the function of sweat? It cools you off. Yeah, it's temperature regulation, right? It helps cool you down. So there's two, actually two types of pseudoriferous glands. You've got merocrine and apocrine sweat glands. So there's the merocrine sweat gland, which is actually more associated with like the watery, salty type of sweat that you guys are familiar with. Apocrine sweat glands are a type of sweat gland that makes a more oily type of sweat. And you only find apocrine sweat glands in the inguinal region, the axillary region, and periareolar. Not on the areola because there's no hair on the areola, but there's hair around the areola, and that has apocrine sweat glands. Now, it's these apocrine sweat glands that produce the oily secretion these are the ones that are suspected to be associated with pheromones. So then where do pheromones come from? Well, axilla, armpit, inguinal, groin, and then around the nipples. So periareolar. So that's kind of interesting. In apocrine sweat, I've never actually seen this before, but apparently it looks like a thick, viscous, whitish type of sweat. And it doesn't flow as like well as other types of sweat. It's more thick and viscous. And it's oily. And it's and it smell, it's the one that's more associated with body odor. Now, here's the thing about body odor, though, is that body odor is, for the most part, not due to the R secretions. Rather, it's the bacteria that are on your body that are eating what you secrete, and then the bacteria are producing odors, and that's associated with what they call your body odor. But the odor is actually mostly not you. It's mostly the bacteria that live on you and then eat what you secrete, and then they make the odor. So you think of like people who smell good or bad, well, they just have differences in bacteria. Yeah. Could you repeat um, areolar, inguinal, and where else are they happening? Oh, axillary, armpit. Think of like, I guess, uh, body odor smelling areas. <laughs> uh, what's what's merocrine sweat like? Watery. Watery type of sweat, right? Where do you find that? Forehead, your arms, your feet. Yeah, exactly. Pretty much everywhere else, right? And it's not just thick skin, but you know, think about those parts of your body that get sweaty first forehead, palms, soles of your feet, they have a, an abundant amount of merocrine sweat glands. But you're going to find them everywhere else anyway. So um, these have a duct that empties right on the surface of skin. 
whereas apocrine sweat glands have a duct that empties on the hair, hair follicle. So you only find apocrine sweat glands in hairy skin, not thick skin, because their duct always only goes onto the hair follicle, okay? And it's more of an oily type of sweat. I know it's kind of gross. Um, sebaceous glands, you guys, that, that's an oily secretion that is associated with your hair follicles. We've talked about this before. This is what helps condition your skin and hair, like naturally. And this is what you want to wash off of your body to prevent stinkiness, right? So why do we wash the oil off our skin and hair? I know, but how, why though? How does it make, how does it prevent stinkiness? It gets rid of, actually not really the bacteria, it gets rid of the oil, which the bacteria feed on. So if you're basically, by taking a shower and bathing, you're taking the nutrients off your body that the bacteria would, would otherwise feed on, if that makes sense. And so if, if you have a certain body odor, it's associated with, with your bacterial content. And here's the weird thing, you guys, is that's dependent on a lot of different factors. Not only just genetic factors, but also your environment, like where you were born and where you've lived and what you eat and, and how you live your life. So what's weird is every single person in this room has different proportions of bacteria on their body, so we all smell a little different, which is how like other animals identify us. Yeah? So all apocrine and sebaceous glands can feed onto your hair follicles. You got it. But which ones sweat? Good, exactly. And then, mer I mean, sorry, the sebaceous are just oil, oil glands, right? But apocrine is an oily type of sweat, if that makes sense. In fact, you guys, apocrine glands, you know, have you ever heard that like dogs don't have sweat glands? Like they say dogs can't sweat? That's not true. Dogs do sweat, but they have apocrine sweat. They don't have merocrine sweat glands. Yeah, but they do have apocrine sweat glands. So, yeah, exactly. You're right, that happens. doesn't really sweat, I guess. Well, there's a, there's a condition called ectodermal dysplasia where you can be born without sweat and oil glands. It's a disorder of ectoderm, which is one of the layers in development. If it doesn't occur properly, then you, you just can't sweat. So what do you guys think is wrong? What, can, what can't those people do then? When they, get they, have they have a lot of difficulty cooling down. You're right. And they have difficulty, they have difficulty thermoregulating. So, um, and also their skin's really dry because they don't make their own oil. So it's kind of interesting. Um, so uh, the American sweat glands, you guys, we talked about this, is like mostly water. It's clear. Controlled by your nervous system. Occurs commonly in the hands, soles of your feet, forehead. But it's also other, other places. It's involved with thermoregulation, like for cooling your body down. Um, secretion and then protection in some regard. Like, how could sweat protect us? You guys know this one? Um, no, I didn't write it down. That's okay. Um, there are immune elements in sweat. Like, there are things your immune system can put in sweat that can help target bacteria and viruses on the surface of your body. So even by sweating, you actually. Uh, already, your immune system actually acts outside of your body, which is pretty cool. Uh, we'll get to that later. I don't, want, I don't want to talk about it. It's too confusing, but we'll come back to that later. <laughs> now, apocrine sweat glands are the oily type of sweat that's associated with body odor, right? And where do you find apocrine sweat glands again? <laughs> Armpit? Groin? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and around the anus. Exactly. So, and around the nipples. So, axilla, areola, Pubic region and anal region. <laughs> the secretion is thick, cloudy, composed of proteins and lipids, and bacterial growth causes a distinct odor. You know what's funny? I've noticed in me, guys, is when I eat junk, I smell bad. If I eat good food, I don't smell as bad. Yeah. Have you guys noticed that with you? Yeah, like if I, if I go out and just like maybe eat, I don't know, pizza and just crappy food, like I'll smell bad for some time later. But if I just eat vegetables and fruit and stuff, like I don't smell, which is weird. In fact, I'll probably smell like the spices that I put in that food. So it's kind of interesting. That's really true. That's true with garlic. Yeah. So, yeah, and you smell like garlic. I, know, I think I probably do. <laughs> so I love garlic. <laughs> um, so sebaceous glands, you guys, uh, they make sebum. Remember, sebum is that oily secretion. It's not sweat, but it's basically, uh, it's a type of secretion that's associated with every hair follicle. And it's a natural conditioner for your skin and hair. Uh, this is controlled not by nervous system stimulation, but hormones. And so these sebaceous glands are become most active right around puberty because sex hormones influence sebaceous gland activity. This is why teenagers start getting really oily right around puberty, whereas like you know uh, prepubescent children aren't as oily or have as many pimples because they don't have as much sebum, right? Well, if if the sebum is mostly oil, 
And oil is what bacteria feed on. This is why teenagers are more prone to pimples, because they secrete so much oil that they're more likely to get those bacterial infections in their sebaceous glands, which is what a pimple is. So uh, it's relatively inactive during childhood, but, but sex hormones that kind of start surging during puberty uh, influence sebaceous gland activity. So it's kind of interesting. And it continues it out throughout adulthood as well, just not as much, if that makes sense. This is why like, adults have less pimples, typically, than teenagers, because we still secrete sebum, but not as much. However, your sebaceous gland activity decreases as you get older. So what does this mean like for the elderly if they don't secrete as much oil? Dry skin, right, dry, cracked skin. And their skin's already thin, which means it's more prone to like cracks that can go deep and possibly bleed, right? So it's, it's important to make sure that like an elderly, like they, what's that? Yeah, they do. Um, and uh, it's important to note that, you know, like an elderly, you want to make sure that they have enough lotion and that kind of stuff. So um, now what these glands look like, well, if there's one that's like right on the hair follicle, what do you guys think that is? It's a sebaceous gland. If it's right on the hair follicle, it's, a, it's actually a sebaceous gland. So this one here is the sebaceous gland. Okay. What about if it has a duct that empties on the, right on the surface of skin but isn't associated with hair? Merocrine. Good. So merocrine sweat gland. And what type of sweat is merocrine sweat? Watery, salty type of sweat. Very good. And then this this one over here, where there's a, there's a duct that empties on the, the shaft of this hair. Apocrine sweat. And then what type of sweat is that? It's cloudy, protein, and lipid-rich sweat. Now, what's important to note, you guys, is that it's not this sweat that stinks. It's the bacteria that feed on the sweat that actually make the odor. So, And you can change the type of bacteria that are in your body. Like That's not constant. So it's kind of interesting. Um, now, <clears throat> so we talk about apocrine and merocrine sweat. So what are the major differences between the two? Which is merocrine. Good. Good. Apocrine secretes the cloudy, viscous, lipid, and protein-rich secretion, right? Now, what about where they're found? Like, where do you find merocrine sweat glands? On the surface, like your forehead, Abundant in the forehead, palms, soles, your feet, but really everywhere where you think about sweat occurring, right? Which is pretty much every patch of skin. What about, where do you find apocrine sweat glands? Armpits, your nipples. Good. Armpits. The perianal, periareolar, it's around the nipples, and the inguinal area. Good. So just, I suppose, think of nether regions. <laughs> like, right? That's all the apocrine it regions. Yeah. Does the sebaceous gland not have a duct? You know, it does, but the, the duct isn't, like, going really far away. The duct just empties straight onto the shaft of the hair. And then, I'm sorry, then going back again, what, is it, what point of the gland has a duct? Exocrine. And these are all ex exocrine glands. So uh, that's a great question. But the sebaceous gland just doesn't have a very long duct. There's a duct, but it's not long. You can't really see it there. Um, <clears throat> other types of glands, you guys, we have ceruminous glands and mammary glands. Uh, the ceruminous glands are the ones that make earwax or cerumen. And that's a modified type of sebaceous, sebaceous gland. So cerumen or earwax is like basically like a thicker type of sebum. What's the point? Why even have earwax? Why not just not make it at all? Yeah, protection, right? Like debris can get trapped by the earwax before it goes deeper, right? What about wax? Does it does it mix well with water? No, no so it also repels water, which would make sense. You don't want to, you don't have water that get trapped in your ear. So the cerumen also can repel water. So it's interesting. But you're right, it's involved with protection. You gotta be careful with like Q-tips though. People make the common mistake of like pushing the Q-tip in, not only too far, but also pushing earwax in with it. You're not supposed to put Q-tips. You're not you're not really supposed to use them, yeah. So. Um, I mean, the alternative is that you just make so much earwax, it just starts falling off, right? But what you don't want to do is push earwax deep into the ear canal because then you get a ceruminous impaction. If you guys are interested, go to YouTube and type in cerumen extraction. Uh, those videos are weird, but also surprisingly, like, satisfying to watch. Just watch, like, <laughs> where they take this big, it looks like a big old ice cream scoop, and they scoop out big globs of, like, this solid earwax substance. What's that? Yeah, bugs can get in there, too, sometimes. Uh, how about mammary glands? Where do you find those? Breast. Yeah, breasts. In, in fact, mammary glands is a modified merocrine gland. So it's a modified sweat gland. So when you think about breast milk, it's actually modified sweat. 
So it's kind of weird. Did I tell you guys that already? Yeah. But I also told you that it was actually like the entire sale that first sofa. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, they say Americrine is modified apocrine square. Yeah. Because apocrine is where the cells burst open. So uh, that's a, um, an interesting thing. Something to consider. <laughs> now, uh, skin cancer, you guys, is basically where these cells have the ability to metastasize. Now, if it's a, if it's a skin tumor, we call that benign, which is not cancerous. It means if it's a benign tumor, it's not invading any nearby tissues. It's just kind of growing as its own separate sort of uh, sack of tissue. Okay. Now, if it metastasizes, we, that's when we call that cancerous. And metastases are when cells can break free, spread to other parts of your body, and start dividing in those other body areas. Right. Now, this is a, this is important because not only is Colorado one of, have one of the highest rates of skin cancer. Melanoma is one of the most deadly forms of cancer. Now, it's deadly because these melanocytes can replicate really quickly, but they can also spread to other parts of your body. You know, what if you had a melanocyte make it to your brain tissue and start dividing in your brain tissue? Then you get this big old mass of, of melanocytes now expanding in your cranium. Well, then it's going to push on your brain, and, you know, that's going to lead to a variety of problems. So any organ that receives blood flow can be affected by cancer like for metastasis. But some common sites of metastasis, you guys, are places like the liver, the spleen, the lungs, the brain, because they get a lot of blood flow, or the kidneys, because they get a lot of blood flow. So, or other, other skin regions, too. Um, now, uh, melanoma is the least common type of cancer, but it's the most deadly. But uh, the, one of the most commons are like, are, are like the squamous cell carcinomas and the basal cell carcinomas. And so what does this look like? Well, this is a melanoma here. And it makes sense. If it's a cancer of melanocytes, it's going to be kind of darker, right? But here's a thing that's kind of tricky about melanoma. Not all melanomas are dark. Some forms of melanoma don't produce melanin. So it's just, it's just a growth of cells, but the cells don't get dark because they don't pack themselves full of melanin. So those are, those are more tough to identify. Why, right? would they, why would one pack themselves Just different, different mutations. Oh. Yeah, good question. So um, the basal cell carcinomas, you guys, are kind of more raised and pearly in appearance. And the squamous cell carcinomas are kind of raised and flaky. You guys have probably seen a squamous cell carcinoma before. Uh, they're common like on elderly people's faces and ears and that kind of stuff. Places where they get a lot of sun. It looks like kind of a roughened patch of skin that's red and flaky. That's probably a squamous cell carcinoma. They're not as uh, dangerous. They could potentially metastasize and spread to the body, but the most fatal form of skin cancer is the melanoma. In fact, Colorado has one of the highest rates of melanoma. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. This is why it's important to get, you know, um, skin checks. So total body skin exams. You know, they're uncomfortable because you have to get naked and then they look everywhere. But, I mean, it can save your life. So. Um, all right, guys. So we're going to wrap up talking about burns and how wounds heal. So with burns, uh, basically this is going to be tissue damage caused by heat, electricity, radiation, and chemicals. It denatures proteins and kills cells. The most immediate threat from burn is actually dehydration or electrolyte imbalance because you can lose a lot of electrolytes like sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium from the burn. If you lose too much water, your kidneys start to shut down, and that can lead to shock. Now, uh, to evaluate burns, you guys get this rule of nines, and it's, it's a way to estimate the amount of fluid loss that could occur. So what this slide is showing is the the percentage of total body skin surface area, right? If you think about all the skin that's on your body, that would be 100% of your skin surface, right? Well, it turns out that the anterior side of your face and neck is 4.5% of your total body surface area. Or the entire anterior part of your upper appendage is 4.5% of your total body surface area. Now, this is an approximation. It's not precise. But this means, based on the average person's body type, this is more a more approximate understanding of, of skin surface area. Okay, the entire anterior trunk is eighteen percent. Okay, um, so what does this mean if it's just the anterior side? Like, how much skin surface area do you find on an entire upper appendage? Nine percent. If it's it's only anterior is four and a half, but anterior and posterior will be nine percent. How about on the entire trunk? Thirty six. Right, eighteen anterior, eighteen posterior, so thirty six percent there. How about on an entire lower appendage? 18%. 18%. What about just the thigh, anterior thigh? Four and a half. Because this is showing 9% as the anterior surface of the whole 
lower appendage. But that means that just the thigh would be 4.5% of your total body surface area. And then the perennial area, you guys, the inguinal area, that's 1%. Okay? So we call this the rule of nines because these are all kind of divisible by nine, if that makes sense, right? So 9% for an upper appendage, 18% for a lower appendage, 36% for uh, your trunk, right? This, is, this part's just showing the anterior surface of all those structures. And this is important to note because if you know how much skin surface area is burned, then you, can, then you can kind of estimate within reasonable accuracy how much fluid that person might lose, right? Because we know our skin's waterproof. If you don't have a skin you're going to evaporate a lot of water in pretty quickly. In fact, that's one of the most life-threatening conditions with the burn is dehydration. And who would have thought? You would think infection, right? Yeah, infections is, you know, something to consider too. But the most immediate threat is dehydration because without a skin, water just starts evaporating from your body, right? So um, if you know how much skin surface area is affected, then you can know how much fluid to give them. Now, uh, there's different types of burns. We got first, second, and third degree burns. For a first degree burn, it's epidermal damage only. So an example of a first degree burn is one that's red. You might get some swelling and some pain, right? Can you guys give an example of first degree burn? Yeah, a mild sunburn, right? A very mild sunburn. Like you're obviously kind of burned. It's kind of red, a little inflamed and painful, but doesn't blister, okay? A second degree burn is going to be where you have epidermal and some dermal damage, and this is more likely to bleed and blister. Have you guys ever had a sunburn that blisters? Then that's a second degree burn. So you've been second degree burned by the sun, right? So if you've ever blistered from the sun, that's second degree because now you're affecting the dermis. And do you find, do you find blood vessels in the epidermis? No. no. So the epidermis won't just blister without damage to the underlying dermis. So with the second degree burn, you're more likely to see blisters that appear. But second degree burns are also painful because it's not deep enough to have damaged all of the nerve fibers in that tissue. Okay? That differs from a third degree burn because this is a full thickness burn. Third degree is the entire thickness of the skin. So through the epidermis and through the dermis, the burn goes all the way deep. This is less likely to be painful because you could singe those nerve fibers. If there's no nerve ending less left, then it won't, you won't feel pain, right? So if you're in a burn that's deep and it's not painful, it's probably a third degree burn. Have you guys ever had that one before? Yeah. I haven't, but I sometimes when I have to float to the burn unit um, yeah. at my job, and people are like already burned. Like, oh wow. And like complete third degree burns. And like self emulsion or accidents. Accidents. Yeah. Sometimes. Both of the times happen. And. Yeah, it's that's scary. Yeah. It, um. And you don't see the pain coming in your body, but like you said, it's kind of in your body. Yeah. Right. Off of I'll tell you what, I got an example for it. I, uh, when I was like 14, I crashed a motorcycle and I burned my, I burned my, my calf on the muffler. The muffler was really hot. So I fell over this way, but my leg was resting on the muffler. It burned through my jeans and got my calf. I didn't even know I had burned until I got home, took a shower, looked at my leg, and saw there was a huge burn on my calf. And it was, it was ghost white. Like there was no blood, because the blood, even the blood vessels were singed. So it's kind of had like a whitish, dry, type of consistency to it because the blood vessels were cinched too. I didn't feel it because the nerve endings were also cinched. That took about four months to grow back. And I was on crutches because I couldn't even walk. I think it actually got down into muscle too. I couldn't walk on that leg. So it's kind of interesting. Um, but it's not painful because people don't have to Skin grafting can be necessary. I didn't get a skin graft. I don't know why. But they just let me let me heal for four months. You know, That's a long time. I'm not exaggerating, guys. Four months. It's like the entirety of my like junior year of well, like uh, the spring semester of my junior year in high school, something like that. Um, so, do you have a question? When you mentioned skin grafting, I was just sitting in some nice back and like you can see on the first photo, yeah. and they remove all that extra skin. Yeah. I guess so you could get some skin from people who oh, that's cool. burned, but then, yeah. You know, that's awesome. Like, I didn't know that. That's why I asked. That is really neat. Yeah, so we'll talk about some uh, tissue grafting and stuff later. That's a, that's a great point. What do you do with all that extra skin? Well, you just do it to somebody else. You have to be a good match, but, you know, there's a lot of skin, especially if you lose a lot of weight. So, it's interesting. Um, it has a kind of a grayish-white appearance, you guys. It's gray and white because that's what the protein fibers look like. Okay? Yes? Um, well, back to what you said, I was wondering, can your body reject a skin graft? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's why you have to be a good match. If you're not a good cross-match, then the graft won't take. We'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that in, in uh, pathophysiology. 
So uh, this is a first degree burn, you guys. If it's first degree, what layer is affected? Just the epidermis. Just the epidermis. Good. And if it's second degree, what layer is affected? The and the and the dermis. But is it the full thickness of the dermis? No. no. Just partial thickness. Good. Just the upper parts of the dermis, like papillary layer, maybe a little bit of the reticular layer, but not all the way through the dermis. And uh, how, how can you differentiate first from second degree burn? Second blisters. blisters. Good. Second degree blisters. First, um, and just redness. redness. The second may also have some bleeding. Second could bleed, right? Is it painful? Yes. Yes? Is first painful? Yes. Does first degree burn blister? No. No, exactly. Good. Um, but here's the thing, you guys, even if the skin barrier is not compromised here, oh, actually it is, I'm sorry. A first degree burn, you can still lose a lot of water through that. Because I know it doesn't look like there's like exposed wounds or anything, anything like that, but within that burn, there's little micro tears. So you can still lose a significant amount of water even through, through a first degree burn. Okay? Like you don't have to have, a, like a, have like an open sore, if that makes sense. So it still affects the skin barrier. You're, you're still prone to infection, if that makes sense. And I've, I've also had a third degree burn. Um, on the same leg on my thigh. <laughs> when I was a kid, I had a bunch of fireworks go off my pocket. And uh, I know, right? Like, how does that happen? Well, I'll tell you. The, and so they're not the kind of fireworks you need to light them. Okay, the I grew up in San Diego, which is right by the border, right? And you can get, you can get whatever you want in Mexico. Like, you name it. And so there's these things they used to sell. I don't think they make them anymore. But they're garbanzo beans covered in magnesium. So when you throw them on the ground, they, like, crack and sparkle, and they burn with a white-hot light. But all they need to activate is you throw them on the ground. I'm not talking about the little white poppers that pop, and you can like pop in your fingers. Not those. It's like that, but like times 3,000. <laughs> I had a, had a whole bag full in my pocket, and I'm running home from my grandparents' house. All of a sudden, and it just all went off my pocket. And so, Did you feel it? Yeah, heck yeah. So I'm looking down, like, I started smacking my thigh. <laughs> And like there's like there's like smoke coming out of my pants and like sparks coming out of my the bottom. And uh, what this means is that and I was right next to the street, you guys, there's traffic going by. That means that someone has a memory of seeing a kid like going <laughs> like with smoke coming out of their pants. I like to meet them. We can like share a good story, right? <laughs> oh, they didn't stop though, they did see it. No one stopped to make sure it was okay. I try to hide it from my parents. They're like kids do. Uh you know, I try to hide it from my parents. And so I, I think I want to try, try to go a full day before I even show my parents. And, and we had some guests in the house at the time, so I showed one of the guests. What do you think? And they were so scared, like, they went and told my parents, like, right away. And, uh, um, yeah, it was pretty bad. They suspected uh, child abuse, though, first. You know, when kids show up with large wounds, they, they suspect child abuse. That's, unfortunately, it's that common. So I remember, I remember uh, they were like, threatening to call uh, Child Protective Services of my dad. We, we, we took me to the hospital. Yeah, it's crazy. But uh, that, that one was a little painful. There were aspects that, that were third degree burns too. Now, what, what's interesting though, you guys, when, the, when the, the tissue heals back, sometimes it heals back in odd ways, and you're prone to things like strictures, which are parts of skin that aren't really as flexible, or you're prone to uh, a lot of itching. So for me, I still got some strictures on my thigh here, like where the skin's kind of tight, so it doesn't move as well, and then it gets more itchy. So sometimes, and even though this happened like almost 20 years ago, like, I still get itchiness in my thigh there. So it's interesting. Um, now, what about wound repair? We're going to wrap up this chapter with wound repair. So let's say if you get a big old cut or wound right here. Um, and it, there might be a good story behind this one, right? Like, how do you get a slash on your forehead? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, you got a big old wound. It goes through the epidermis, now into the dermis. If it's in the dermis, it's going to bleed. The, those blood vessels are ruptured. Blood starts to fill that wound, right? And it, so then you start to get a blood clot that forms. Now, part of this immune response, you guys, is that mast cells get activated. They release histamine, which is an inflammatory molecule, stimulates an inflammatory immune response, which increases blood flow to that site of injury. But it also brings in more immune cells. So the second step in wound repair is we have macrophages come in and start to break down any kind of debris or, or dead tissue in the wound. Fibroblasts come in. They start laying down new fiber. Right, because fibroblasts are the stem cell for connective tissue proper, and because the dermis is made of CT proper, the fibroblasts can come in and start to make new connective tissue there. Okay, now uh, the epithelium also kind of grows inward and starts to fill in these edges, and these fibroblasts start to put down more collagen, elastic fibers, more more ground substance, and replace this, um, you know, this connective tissue. Now, you're still going to get a scab here that's up top, 
But what's interesting, though, is that the scab will persist even though the epithelium has grown beneath it. And as this um, connective tissue gets replaced, eventually this scab gets pushed up and off. So when the scab falls off, it's basically when there's enough connective tissue to uh, force this up, and then it falls off eventually. Right? But if you've ever lost a scab and you look beneath it, it won't bleed, but the tissue is really tender. Yeah. Right? Is what I'm talking about? That's this sort of circumstance. Like, if, you, if that's ever happened to you, you've had the circumstance where it's like it hasn't totally healed back yet. There's still an epithelium. The scab falls off, but this epithelium is thin. And that's why it's very sensitive and, and kind of delicate. It doesn't bleed necessarily, but, um, you know, it's more sensitive because the epithelium is so thin there. Um, and last step, you guys, we, we get the scar tissue that forms. And the scar tissue is remodeled for years and decades post-wound. In fact, um, you know, like I said, my wife works in dermatology. Apparently, you don't even really know what a scar is going to look like until it's been about a year. Like if someone's worried about a scar and it's only been three months, uh, it's hard to say what that's going to look like in the long term until about a year later because it takes that long for the scar to form, right? In its truest form. Otherwise, uh, you can get a lot of like post erythema, like a lot of redness on that wound in the scar, even though the wound's been like three or four months prior. So it won't be until like at least a year you can know what the scar might look like in the long term. Is okay. there like ways to like get rid of scars? Yeah, there are. Yeah, it's interesting. Lasers and chemical peels, that kind of stuff. Um, now some scars can be more raised. Like if the connective tissue uh, forms too heavily, you can get a keloid scar. And a keloid scar is basically just like a big old raised scar. Okay. They're more, I guess, sort of aesthetically unappealing because it's, so, it's much different from the surrounding tissue and it's more raised. Um, and that's just an example of a keloid scar.